Hi everyone and welcome to today's video where we're going to be doing a guide for playing in Japan for U4 1.37 Winds of Change. So for the purposes of this guide we are going to be playing as the nation of Oda right here one of the best daimyos in Japan in my opinion right here. They do start off with plus 10% morale of armies and plus 10% infantry combat ability which is really the most important things you want to look out for when playing as any daimyo right here. They're starting traditions right here because that's going to help you in your initial wars and in consolidating Japan. Although the rest of their ideas are amazing as well continuing with plus 10 percent goods produced minus 10 percent core creation cost and minus 10 percent province war score cost plus one land leader shock plus one land leader siege plus 10 percent land fire damage minus five percent tech cost and plus 20 percent national manpower which makes Oda ideas some of the best in the entirety of the game not just in japan by following along with this guide you could play as Oda but the gameplay as any of these guys is pretty much the same so this guide can be used for any daimyo over in Japan maybe with the exception of So right here but other good picks you could try and go for are Hosokawa right here they do start off with some nice traditions as well then you got Tokugawa right here they're also really strong Uesugi is not bad either and those are some you know better nations that I think are located in Japan even though for the purposes of this guide we're going to be playing as Oda by playing as any daimyo you will go on to crush any of your neighbors around you and pretty much in no time go on to conquer the entire region of Japan maybe with the exception of Yuku right here before going on to expand in Korea and in Manchuria and maybe even China or if you want to play tall you could stay in Japan maybe take Korea as well or you could also go colonial so there are many options with what you want to do by playing in Japan regarding the mission tree all of the daimyos right here have a pretty similar mission tree that gets sort of upgraded when you form japan and unless you're going to be colonizing i don't actually recommend taking japanese ideas because they are different to these daimyo ones so for conquest you are going to want to stick with daimyo ones whereas for colonization you're definitely going to go with the japan ones either way sit back relax and learn what you need to do as any daimyo to play in japan all right all right here we are as oda or as whichever daimyo you picked and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go into our estate and summon the diet you can choose whichever agenda is best for you then we're going to give the clergy religious state and clerical advisory council along with religious diplomats and clerical education then we're going to give the nobles primacy of the nobility increased levies and aristocratic counselors and then we're going to give the merchants land of commerce patronage of the arts commercial advisory board and indebted to the burghers then we're going to seize land now, as any daimyo right here, you're also going to want to set up a little bit of an alliance network. If you're playing in the middle, maybe one ally north, one ally south. If you're playing in the south, maybe two allies up north. If you're playing up north, maybe two allies in the south, something like that. As Oda, we do start off allied to Shiba, which I am going to keep for a little while. And I'm going to look for another ally, perhaps a nation that I will fight way later that I don't need to fight right now. So maybe that's going to be someone like Ouchi down here, for example. And then with the other diplomat, we're going to Royal Mary Ashikaga, the Shogun. And with that same diplomat, we're going to be improving relations with Ashikaga for the entirety of the campaign. This is because if the Shogun deems us as a threat or something like that, they may force us to commit seppuku, which is not a very good thing. We don't want that to happen. Just by royal marrying them and by keep improving relations with them, you can generally avoid it. The other thing you want to do is tell your merchant right here that's a Nippon to establish communities. This will help with that as well. And the other free merchant, really, he's not going to have anything to do. You can just tell him to collect in Beijing or something like that. Next, we do need to rearrange our army a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our main army right here and hire one more infantry regiment. We do have the special samurai units, of course, as any nation in Japan, but we don't need to use them right now. We'll get them up later. And then what you want to do is also hire the free company and then we're gonna go ahead and hire just one advisor first go into your mill advisors right here and see if you have a morale discipline fort defense or manpower level one mill advisor if you do have any of those guys go ahead and hire them if you don't have any of those guys just hire whichever level one admin advisor you want since i have a fort defense guy i am gonna hire him now we can put our ruler in charge of the army just like that later we'll recruit a general and it's time to wait for a month so we can start declaring wars. As any daimyo right here, we have a special CB to use versus any other daimyos, the Sengoku CB, and that's everything we're going to be using. No need to spy on anyone right here. And obviously, don't set any rivals just yet. We don't want our rivals potentially allying each other. So, when starting off as Oda, you could declare on any one of these three nations that you border right at the start. Sure, Toki right here isn't that good because they have a level 3 fort, so ideally, you would declare on Tokugawa or Kitabatake. If you're playing as any other 
Daimyo, at this point you're looking around to see which of your neighbors is the easiest to fight. Once a couple of months have ticked by and your free company is up and it started gathering morale, go ahead and check and see. So let's analyze Tokyo right here. They don't have any allies, but to fight them, I would need to recruit a couple of more infantry regiments just so we can siege down the level 3 fort. Tokugawa right here has gotten three allies, but two of them wouldn't help them, so I could fight them in Date right here. And then Kita Batake, their ally to Uesugi, which would help them, which is kind of annoying. So I do have a couple of options here in my game. What I'm actually going to do in my game right here is hire two more infantry regiments just like that and declare on Toki because they don't have any allies. So even though they have a level 3 fort and this war would take the longest, I'm still going to do it first. There's always an option for that. Now, there's another school of thought right here that you shouldn't immediately start off by popping conquest wars left and right and that you could actually start off by doing a couple of humiliate slash show strength wars on your rivals right here just to form some monarch points. Basically, when you show strength on someone, you get 100 points in each category. You can do that if you want to. It's a great strategy. It's just not something I personally do when playing in Japan. My main goal is to unify it as fast as possible, although that's definitely great as well. Now that my infantry regiments have been recruited, I am ready to declare my first war. Before your first war is when you're going to want to rival the nations that you're going to fight. So there we go. I'm going to rival Toki, Tokugawa right here, who's right next to me. And I'm also going to rival Kitabatake, who's also right next to me. And there we go. There's my declaration on Toki. Our first war started. You're fighting whichever nation is the easiest for you to fight. Unlike other nations around the world where we usually have sort of more strict paths to follow along with who we fight first, who we fight second, when playing in Japan, it's really always the easiest neighbor you can fight. And that's how you're going to do it the entire campaign until you conquer all of Japan. And there we go, just like that, this quick and easy first war is done. It took super quick for me because as we can notice right here, the fort wasn't maximally garrisoned when I was sieging it. It was around 800 out of 3000. So that's why it fell so fast. And whichever nation you're fighting, you're going to full annex them no matter how large they are. You really don't care about aggressive expansion over in Japan because even if coalitions form, I'll give you an example later, not everyone will want to declare that coalition war against you and it probably won't ever even happen. So there we go. There's your first war done. The easiest nation that's your neighbor, you've full annexed or you've shown strength to your rival and gotten 100 points in each category. Once that war is done, you can either wait for the core to finish building or you can immediately declare your next war. It's totally up to you depending on how comfortable you are. Now, while I'm waiting for that decor, I actually am going to declare a humiliate war on my rival Tokugawa right here, just to show you how that whole thing happens if you want to do it more than me. A lot of players, they like to show strength three or four times before they move on with their conquests. And there we go. Now that Date has been full annexed, and now that I have 100% war score versus Tokugawa, I'm going to select the show strength option, which is what you're going to do as well if you're going for this. And there we go. That's that war done. And we've gotten 100 points in each category. Now, when playing in Japan, you're periodically going to get these types of incidents where either you can focus on the open outcome of the incident or on the isolationist outcome. And you can see all of those things right here in the religion tab. Basically, these right here are the possible incidents. And this is the one that's active right now. So you may think, what does the open and isolationist outcome do? And you will notice that if you hover on here right now, our isolation level is level two. And those are the modifiers we get construction discount and promote culture cost. And basically by choosing what to do in these incidents, you can either go up a level or down a level or something like that. So you can aim towards any of these modifiers you see right here that you think will be beneficial to your gameplay. Right now, I actually want to go down a level and go to the adaptive level for minus 5% idea cost and plus 10% institution spread. So that's why I'm going to focus on the isolationist outcome of that incident. Now that our second war is done, once again, I'm looking to declare on some of my weakest neighbors right here. Let's take a look at Hatakayama, which has two provinces. Actually, they have two allies, but their allies won't help them, which is perfect. So there we go. There's my next declaration. You're pretty much doing the same. And there we go. That's another war done. Like I said earlier, always full annex whoever you're fighting if you can full annex them and make sure to take all of their money as well. And there we go. That's another war done. Obviously, as you expand, your loan size will grow larger as well. So even though this is bankruptcy looming right here, we are going to pay off those loans with the ducats that we just got. Our loans are going to get bigger. We're going to go ahead and take bigger loans to pay off the previous smaller loans. That's how you sort of juggle the economy at the start right here. You have to keep growing in order to increase your loan size so you can use those new bigger loans to pay off the old smaller loans. And obviously, make sure to pick up new burger loans as well. There we go. Now my loan size has increased for the third time. Now there are 17 ducats, so I'm paying off some old 
eight and nine ducted loans that's how you pretty much do it right now after chilling a bit i've noticed this nation right here they don't have any allies so it's perfect to declare on them always keep looking for these guys you know kitabataki right here we can also fight they're also allyless hosokawa a little more powerful nation at the start of the game but they also don't have any allies right here uesugi they have blown up a bit but they do have allies so keep looking around you if you start off somewhere right here maybe it's better to finish off everyone down south before moving north if you're playing up here, it's the same thing. Finish somebody off up here, then keep going down. Whereas if you start off in the middle right here, maybe in a game such as Oda, what I like to do is eat half of Japan first and then focus on the other half later. Or you could expand simultaneously. It's totally up to you. Either way, there's my declaration on Ogasawara. And on Kitabatake, you don't always have to wait to finish one war before you do another one. Of course, you may have noticed that this war is already done. That fort fell super, super quickly because none of these forts are usually garrisoned because these daimyos want to save money. This is a level one fort. Its max garrison is a thousand, but I attacked it when it was this little. So you can imagine how quick some of these forts fall. Now, whenever you core something, make sure to full state it and lower autonomy as soon as possible. That will once again increase our loan size, increase our money making abilities, increase our force limit and everything like that. So definitely full full state everything that you conquer this too for example in my game and once you do actually grow by about two states you will be able to take our first mission expand the coca right here which gives us plus one yearly prestige and plus one yearly legitimacy you may have noticed that i didn't mention these missions too much and that's because we're not really strictly focusing on doing any of these just yet we're probably going to get a bunch of them just by playing along and then after we're done with everything we're going to focus on actually actively pursuing them and there we go, that's another war done, another full annexation, and all of these guys' money. Now we'll start pouring that up, and the other stuff that I have already full stated, we're gonna lower autonomy on them. Super, super important. Of course, you should make sure to buy down inflation from time to time too. And you could definitely also focus on admin if you don't have an admin advisor. And this is what I was talking about. Now my loans are 23, right? So I'm gonna take out a couple of 23 ducat loans to pay off some old 17 ducat loans and 19 ducat loans just like that. Now we're gonna go ahead and take new burger 23 ducat loans to pay off even more 17 or 19 ducat loans or even new 23 ducat loans and that's how you decrease your loans now that everything has been cored up it's time to move along with our wars once again let's take a look at our opportunities right here hosokawa doesn't have any allies but to fight some of these island guys right here on these separate islands we need to build up our navy a little bit with galleys so that's out of the question Yamana right here, a little too annoying for right now. Uesugi, they're already allied to Yamana. These two guys, they're allied to Uesugi, which seems like an easy enough war. And then Utsunomiya right here, they're allied to Chiba. But let's go with these guys first, since they have three provinces. So there we go, not complicated at all. If you're newer to the game, make sure to not declare on Ashikaga for some reason. They're the emperor. There we go, I just white pieced Shiba right here. No need to co-belligerent or non-co-belligerent anyone. Just take everyone one by one. And there we go, there's another war right there. Done. You may have noticed we're in another war right here, and this isn't a war that I declared. This is a war that happens sometimes where the Shogun actually decides to declare on a daimyo that they don't like too much. As we can see, Ashikaga right here has just declared on Yamana because they've grown too large or gotten independent or something like that. No need to help out in any of these wars. Let these guys do their own thing. And keep in mind, even while wars like these are going on, you can still fight other daimyos, which is exactly what I'm going to do now by declaring on Uesugi because their ally Imagawa right here won't join. It's as simple as that. And now that this war with Uesugi is done for me, I'll be full annexing them and taking all of their money. Like I mentioned earlier, you don't really worry about coalitions or aggressive expansion here. Because you've been lowering autonomy everywhere, rebels will start rising up periodically. After war, take some time to maybe force pop out some rebels, provoke revolts, and fight them so you don't have to deal with them while you're actually fighting wars. Once you've gotten tech 4 in every category, it's not a bad idea to force spawn the renaissance in your capital of Oda or whichever province you control is the cheapest. Some players don't like to do this at all and only focus on developing institutions after they taken care of all of japan but that's only if you're going really really aggressively and in that case you don't really need a guide so after you got tech for in every category make sure to develop the cheapest province to force spawn the renaissance obviously you're going to make sure to activate encourage development bump up that province to 15 after that expand infrastructure hopefully it's a level two center of trade maybe it produces cloth as well even though there aren't any cloth provinces over in Japan. For your tier 2 government reform, I recommend strengthen noble privileges. Now that I'm done helping out my ally Ouchi in a certain war, I'll be declaring on Ando up here. They're fairly large and they don't have any allies, so that's a bunch of provinces for us. 
Once you have about half of Japan, you should try and gather up some cash to maybe build up around 10 to 15 galleys. And now that this war is done, there we go, we're gonna be full annexing Ando over here and taking all of their money. As we can see, there's no more nations left, enough to form a coalition against us, so it's really not a problem. Now something that's not very good that might happen in your campaign is Ashikaga actually growing quite large like it has happened in my game. As you all know they do start off with two provinces right here but since they fought that one daimyo right here they took a bunch of land and now they've just annexed whichever yellow nation was over here and maybe they're gonna annex someone else they might end up being over a hundred percent war score which means you'll need two wars to take these guys down which actually kind of sucks. So hopefully you're fast enough to where you'll be able to annex everyone before Ashikaga Kaga does it but in this recent couple of patches maybe 1.37 1.36 maybe even 1.35 ashikaga is quite aggressive when annexing other daimyos so be careful with that right now as we can see i've conquered pretty much everyone up north and the only nation i have a land border with is ashikaga which we obviously always want to fight last that means that I'll have to manually spy on some of these guys over here in order to declare on them, so I don't really have the ability to use the Sengoku CB, even though it's not really a problem. So I'm just gonna spy on Chosokabe. Once you've fought enough battles, you'll be able to take the mission Bushido Code, which gives you 1.5% discipline. Not very relevant. Whenever you start getting some big loans and some real cash, it is time to start constructing buildings immediately, even if you still have a bunch of debt. We need to revitalize our economy as soon as possible. So first, start off with marketplaces in the center of trade and estuary provinces. Then, move on with churches. Obviously, we're still lowering autonomy anytime that we can. Now that we're done consolidating the economy a little bit, it's time to move on with our wars by declaring on the next weakest nation that we can fight, and that's Amago right here, which I actually happen to have a truce with, because my ally Ouchi fought them earlier. So that's why I'll be declaring on Chosokabe right here. Their ally So won't join. By this point, I have built up my navy large enough to where I can fight these guys on these islands right here. At this point, I'll also be breaking my alliance with Ochi. For a first stage ability, you can take whatever you want to. None of these are really too relevant in my experience when playing in Japan, unless you've gone with the colonization option, in which case definitely go for higher developed colonies. I'm gonna go with justified wars. And there we go, the war with this nation is done. That's another full annex. Now, once you had Admin Tech 5, it will be time for your first idea group and for your first idea group as Oda or any militarily focused nation over in Japan, whether you're staying as that nation or their national ideas and playing a tall campaign or whether you're blobbing in East Asia, it will be the same pick. Obviously, if you're going colonial with whichever nation or Japan, you're going to open up exploration expansion. But if you're doing the two other routes, then the picks are pretty much the same. And what I recommend for your first idea group is quality ideas. Quality ideas are obviously a no brainer as a bunch of these infantry combat ability having guys right here. There is even more infantry combat ability. The army tradition is great, which we already do get a lot from from battles, especially in the early point of the campaign. Cap combat is excellent as well, but since we're an island nation and we will be utilizing boats quite a lot, all three of these ideas right here related to our navies are super strong as well, and then the artillery combat and discipline obviously already know. So that's why I think this is the best opener, whether you're doing a playing tall or a playing wide Japan run. Quality ideas for your first idea group. Unless you're colonizing, of course. Now that I've dealt with some rebels, I'm once again continuing my expansion campaign over in the south by declaring on Amago, using the Conquest CB because I don't border them and I don't have the Sengoku, they don't have any allies, pretty simple. And there's another simple war done and three more provinces for us. As we can see by this point, there should be only a few daimyos left. Ashikaga is integrating Ouchi right now. We'll probably get to eat them before Ashikaga does. They're also integrating Ito and then it's just so left right here. So only three more guys left to fight. You'll pretty much clean everyone up over here, then go for So because you'll have the boats, and then it's time to fight the Shogun. In my game, unfortunately, I will need two wars versus them. Now that a little bit of time has passed, I'll be declaring on Ouchi right here, my former ally that Ashikaga is annexing right now, and I'll co-belligerent Ito as well. Let's wipe both of these guys out. And now that this war is done, I'll peace out Ito right here first for all of their provinces and all of their money. And now we can peace out Ouchi as well, once again, for all of their provinces and all of their money. And just like that, in about 20, 30, or 40 years, depending on how quick you were playing, you should have wiped out all of the other daimyos and the only other nation that should be left in Japan, of course, aside from Yuku and anyone that's up here like Ainu or Orichoni in my game, should be Ashikaga. Hopefully you were fast enough to where Ashikaga doesn't have more than 100% war score cost, 
but if something like this happens like in my game, it's really no big deal, you'll just fight them twice. While you're getting ready for your final war, basically the war with Chicago right here, it's not a bad idea to spy on them a little bit and get some claims. And once you've cored everything up from your war versus the final daimyo, you're good to go ahead and declare on Ashikaga. There's the declaration you're gonna declare with war for the emperor, because they are your overlord, you will be losing stability with this, but either way, it's just something that has to be done. So there we go, there's my declaration. And once we wrap it up with Ashikaga, you're gonna go ahead and take as many provinces as you can, including Kyoto. These are the provinces that I'm gonna take in my game right here, and that's about it. So they'll be left with these four provinces that we're gonna take care of later. Hopefully, you will have been able to get this done in just one war in your campaign. And there we go, just like that, if you've taken Kyoto, now you yourself have become the Shogun and Ashikaga is your vassal. This is not a big deal since even if they're left with a couple of provinces, they are pretty small and you will be able to integrate them pretty quickly. After this war, you may be able to take a couple of missions over here, which of course you should do that give you further claims over on Korea. And depending on the provinces that you took, if of course you did take Kyoto, you will have the option to unite Japan. And if we do take that decision, we stop being the Shogun right here, which... You know, depending on the type of gameplay you want to do, you could remain the Shogun and Daimyo the entire world, but that's definitely not a playthrough that we're showcasing right here. And of course, all of your Daimyos will become independent, which is something you would maybe rather do rather than staying as a Shogun and waiting to integrate these guys. So if you do end up forming Japan, which I do recommend that you do, if Ashikaga is left over, they will become independent. And just like that, we are Japan. Now, after you form Japan, you will obviously have the ability to take new traditions and ambitions you can go with the Japanese ideas right here or you can stick with your own for example Odin ideas or any other daimyo that you've chosen and what I recommend is if you're going for the colonization playthrough that you do go with Japan traditions and ambitions if you're planning to play tall however maybe just in the region of Japan maybe in the Nippon trade node or something like that if you don't plan on blabbing out a whole lot or if you do plan on doing that either way you should not take the Japanese ones. So on the three different types of playthroughs, only go with the Japanese ones if you're colonizing. I'm not for the purposes of this guide, so I say we can't abandon our roots. And just like that, we are Japan, but we stay with the absolutely super powerful Oda national ideas. Of course, if you do end up forming Japan like this, you won't have any unique government reform, no daimyo, no independent daimyo, no shogun or anything like that. And you can choose whichever one of these you want to. All of them are actually pretty good in my opinion. You could become an Eastern plutocracy, technically trading republic, which would be very good for a money-making blobbing campaign. If not, if you're playing tall or doing a regular conquest or something like that, then I definitely recommend an autocracy or feudal nobility. In my game, I'm gonna go with autocracy. After you do end up forming Japan and full annexing or almost full annexing Ashikaga, I recommend that you chill for about a year or two, maybe work on your economy a bit, full state everything, lower autonomy everywhere, build up some buildings, build up some boats, because our next targets will be these guys up here that aren't Ming tributaries, and of course, pretty soon, nations that are Ming tributaries, maybe some of these guys right here, or even Korea, which isn't one in my game. But don't be deceived, Korea is a difficult nation to fight, definitely do not underestimate them. They're harder to fight than Ming. For your tier 3 government reform, if you stayed as a shogun or if you took feudal nobility and you're planning to play with vassals, representatives of the crown isn't a bad idea. If you're playing more independently, then of course I recommend going centralized monarchical bureaucracy or expand a real court. Once you hit admin tech 7, it will be time for your second idea group. If you're colonizing, it's gonna be expansion after you took exploration. If you're playing tall or blobbing, I recommend a money-making idea group such as economic or trade. It's totally up to you. Economic will help us out with quite a lot of things that we have going for us, even gold mines that we're going to get later on, and trade, of course, is a no-brainer for a region such as this that you want to conquer later. You would even move your main trade node over to Beijing and route all of this right there. So that will be a pretty good pick for getting more merchants, once again, to route everything over there. And I especially recommend it if you also took Eastern Plutocracy for your Tier 1 government reform. Since I didn't go with the trading route, I am gonna go economic. Once a little bit of time has passed after you've unified Japan, worked on your economy a little bit, as we can see it shouldn't be too bad right now, stated everything, lowered autonomy, built a couple of buildings, fought some rebels, it is time to move on with your next wars that will be technically outside of Japan. And simply look for the easiest nation to fight over here in this region. It could be any one of these wars, it could be Ainu over here, 
figure it could even be Korea, depending on the situation with Ming. The two options I have right now are fighting Orochoni up here to take stuff over here from them and over here as well, but they're allied to Oirat, and that's kind of an annoying war for right now, even though we could win it. The other option right here is Korea, which doesn't have any allies, isn't a Ming tributary, they just lost a war to Ming, and their navy has gone down quite significantly, which means even though Korea is a very tough to fight, their provinces are extremely highly developed and it will take quite a lot of wars to take them down. For me, Korea is an easier pick. What I recommend more is fighting these guys first, but if Korea is looking easier for you, then definitely go for them. So there we go. There's my declaration on Korea. I'll declare for that province right there. And there we go. Be careful when fighting these guys. Do not underestimate them. And there we go. Now I've defeated Korea. I even got the free company up for this just to be safe. And once you defeat Korea as well, try and take as much as you can out of the provinces that you have the initial claims on. So I'm going to take the island of Jeju right here just so we're not bothered with it later on. And then I'm going to do something like this, for example. Those are all of the provinces I have claims on. And perfect, that's your first war with Korea done. You're not worrying about aggressive expansion right here because they're the only Korean cultured nation. You're not worrying with these guys as aggressive expansion. And, you know, they're different religions too. Some of these guys are animist and Tengri. These guys over here are Confucian. So no need to worry about aggressive expansion at all. And that's your first war with Korea done. Ideally, you've taken everything that you have claims on, if you could have. Now, something I didn't mention earlier is that you do get new Japanese missions when you form Japan. You could complete the old Oda missions before doing this if you want to. Something I recommend you do after forming Japan is trying to complete this mission up here where you need to have all of these requirements fulfilled and no loans. That is the most important part. If you do that and develop this province up to 8 production and then take the mission, you will spawn gold in that province right there. So that's one of the gold mines that I was referring to earlier. So try and get that done as early as possible. If you have a leftover Ashikaga, just like in my game, whenever your truce with them is up, go ahead and clean them up. And there we go, my second war with Ashikaga is done, and there's the four provinces that we didn't have. Right now, I've also just paid off my final loan, and I can take this mission right here. Make sure to have developed this province up to 8, or even 10, like in my game right here, before you do. And just like that, we have gold. Now that I've chilled a bit, once again, focused on the economy a little bit, gotten Miltek 7, gotten cannons up, I will be continuing my wars by fighting Orochoni. Orochoni is still allied to Oirat and they still have Nivik as their subject, but realistically we have to do it because all of these other guys right here are Ming tributaries. And even though we can piece out Ming relatively quickly right here, if we catch them at low mandate and with weak navies, let's just do the other guys that aren't Ming tributaries first. So, there's my declaration on Orochoni, maybe Ainu will be here in your game, in which case you'll have to clean them up pretty quickly, and actually, in my game, Oirat won't even help out because they're involved in a different war. So this is a literally a perfect opportunity. There we go. And there we go, my war with Orochoni and their subject Nivik is pretty much done. I could have taken more, but they are fighting a bunch of other nations at the same time, and that's been occupied by those other nations, so I'm only gonna take everything that I can. And there we go. There's my first war versus some of these hordes up here done. For your tier 4 government reform, I recommend expanded temple rights. Since we're going to have a lot of churches, it's going to help out quite a lot. Another very interesting one right here is interweaving of shrine and state, which will allow divine idea groups, even if we're a monarchy like we are right now, or a republic, and it gives us religious unity and Kanushi loyalty. I don't think divine is that good. No need to take it. So that's why I'm going to go with expand temple rights. When it's time to choose your naval doctrine, you will notice a unique one right here for plus 5% morale of navies and plus 5% heavy ship combat ability. Since we'll be using mainly galleys to fight any of these guys over here, I still recommend free oarsmen. Maybe you could go with that other one if you're doing a colonization playthrough. Now, after you've done a war versus the hordes and after you've done a war with Korea, maybe if Ming wasn't involved, what you need to keep an eye out is Ming's mandate level right here, which when it's low, that's precisely when we want to hit them or not specifically them, but hit their tributaries. And as soon as it drops pretty low, as soon as Ming takes another reform, I'll show you exactly how to do it. Very easy. There we go. Now we can notice that in my game right here, Ming has just taken his third celestial reform which means mandate is low which means he has all these negative modifiers right here and that in turn means that it's really really easy to defeat ming 
So this is how you do it. What I recommend right here is actually declaring on Ryuku at this point in the game. That means that Ming will come in and defend them because Ming is their overlord. At the same time, just one or two months after you declare that war, you should go ahead and declare on another Ming tributary, which is actually your main target. And that will be Korea in my game because my truce with Korea is up. And because I have 100 spy network, I can just get my claims up right now, just like that. And in that war, Ming won't come in, so that's actually our main target. In these Ming Wars, what you can do is use your navy to blockade them, get them up with devastation so you can white piece them. You can either just sit here and do nothing because Ming will try and land armies. Once they do land, you can go ahead and beat them up or you can take your army yourself and fight Ming. Trust me, no matter how big their army is, they will be super easy to fight because you'll maybe have a tech advantage. Let's see, in my game, we're actually equal, but you'll definitely have an army advantage. So it's no big deal fighting Ming. Now, just a quick intermission right here. I have built 15 workshops now. And when you do that, you will take this mission. Depending on your isolationism level, you will get in a different bonus. So there we go. I've built up my Navy quite a lot. Lots of galleys building up a couple of heavies as well. We are over Naval Force Limit, but it's not a big deal. So there's my declaration on Ryukyu. This is the phony war, even though we actually are going to take Ryukyu. Since Ming isn't trying to land immediately, what I'll do is I'll land. Still in this war, still haven't declared on Korea. I'll let you know the right time. At this point, I can take the Bushido mission right here. And there we go. We can see the previews for this one branching mission right here. You can either do this mission to gain these bonuses, or you can do this mission to gain these bonuses. Basically, it's an army and a navy mission. I'm gonna go with the army one. Once you beat up Ming a little bit, gain a little bit of war score with them, and they're out of manpower, that's when you go ahead and declare your real war. My real war is obviously versus Korea. And now that I've pretty much defeated Korea, and once you pretty much defeat your main target, you can go ahead and take whatever you want from them. What I'm gonna do in my game right here is take all of this, and then I'll have one more war to finish off Korea if someone else doesn't. And there we go. That's my real war with them. Done. Now we can go ahead and focus on Ming, take all of their money, and then just go for Ryukyu. If you end up sieging down Beijing, you will gain this event right here where you can either bring it to Kyoto to gain these bonuses, burn it down for some mil points, or do nothing for some prestige. Since this is a pretty good one, I do recommend taking it for the institution spread. And once you beat up Ming enough to where you can take all of their money, you can go ahead and piece them out, and just like that, you can annex Ryukyu as well, which was your phony war. And there's Ryukyu full annex and all of their money, and now we officially own the entire region of Japan. And by the way, the thing that we got over here in Kyoto, which I just reinforced, that's how we love have a level two capital fort, which you don't usually see, is the thing that Korea has, which makes them have like two capitals. Now that these wars are done, I'm going to chill a little bit because I have used up all my manpower fighting these guys. Wasn't difficult, but it was slightly annoying. Now, since you will start farming quite a lot of money very quickly as Japan right here, as we can see, I've just spent about 2000 ducats upgrading centers of trade and starting constructing some buildings. You will be able to start construction on monuments relatively quickly. The first one right here is Mount Fuji, which at tier three gives us some very nice local dev bonuses and tax bonuses. And globally, it gives us yearly prestige. The other one right here is these palaces, which at tier three give us 100% prestige from land battles more, along with minus 100% war score cost and 10% general cost. A very, very good one for warfare style playthroughs. Then we have the Imperial City of Kyoto at tier 3. It gives us some nice bonuses towards expansion and playing with subjects. And of course, we have the Himeji Castle right here, which at tier 3 gives us some nice bonuses for spy and prestige stuff. None of these are really like super, super good or super, super powerful. But hey, whenever you can start constructing them, at least you'll get them up to tier 1. Something I did forget to mention earlier is that after you start making money, you can start getting samurai regiments up. I did do it way earlier than this. Once you lower autonomy to the max in most places you will be able to take the Edo Jidai mission right here where this event happens and we gain a dev discount and global prosperity growth for about 25 years. After we beat Ming up so hard, a bunch of nations have started popping out of them. Hopefully that'll happen for you as well. In that case, it will be easier to conquer China, if it's your goal, of course. And by the time you end up fighting Ming, your game should look a little something like this. Basically, we started off as any Japanese daimyo of your choosing, Oda in this case, in this guide, and by carefully fighting all of your neighbors around you literally the entire time, picking off the weakest or the best ones to fight, depending on your opportunities, you should have ended up uniting Japan, owning the entirety of the region of Japan, and you should have started pushing into Korea and into the Jurchen tribes up here. Of course, everyone's game is 
different with alliances and opportunities and stuff like that but by following along with this general formula of fighting your weakest neighbors around you you should have had no problems unifying japan and then taking care of ashikaga whether immediately or in two wars and then pushing into these guys right here of course the start is pretty tumultuous as these guys right here of course some of you may have struggled with cash that is the main problem at the start of the game i would say the first five years at least until you get like 10 ish provinces or something like that and like i said at the start you have to keep full stating everything and the lowering autonomy every time you can because that is how you gain bigger loans with those bigger loans you pay off the previous smaller loans and then you keep doing that for the entirety of the campaign of course during this point you should have also been focusing on the economy not just trying to get out of debt by also by building up your country it is pretty difficult to do that because you really won't be using your money for that you'll be using it to pay off loans and build boats and build armies but by around the time you have two-thirds of japan really whenever you get some extra cash you should start building buildings these are all the marketplaces that I've built in all of the center of trade and estuary provinces. You should have looked to build something similar. A couple of workshops here and there. There aren't that many high value trade goods over here, especially none over here in the north. But everything that you can build, you should build. Obviously, churches in all of the provinces that give you more than 0.1 ducats income per month. A couple of army buildings here and there in the grain and livestock provinces and such. And you get the point. Basically, after this, you already know what to build. Now, when playing as any daimyo, you don't really have to form Japan right away like i did i only did it for the purposes of this guide to show it off what i recommend the most is that you actually complete the daimyo mission tree first because this japan mission tree it is kind of weird in my opinion probably one of the worst major mission trees it doesn't even give you any further claims on areas right here that you want to conquer whereas the daimyo mission trees do so maybe you will want to form japan later on and stick with the independent daimyo or with the shogunate government reform until you finish off those missions but as you all know after forming japan you don't get a unique government type and honestly you get a worse mission tree rather than what the daimyos have so what is the real purpose of forming japan well if you're colonizing like i said colonizing is one of the three ways you can play japan in my opinion that's the first one basically maybe conquer all of japan conquer all of korea or something like that own the nippon trade node and then you can go and colonize everything down here maybe turn into trade companies maybe go to the new world the choice is up to you then the next option is playing tall japan where you only conquer maybe the region of japan or japan and korea once again the nippon trade node or something like that and then focusing on slow and steady expansion building up your country or you could do the wide run which is what i'm doing in this playthrough right here where you're basically aiming to own pretty much everything over here but no matter which run you went with if you went with the colonizing guide that's what you'll start doing colonizing the uncolonized provinces here fighting these guys down here if you're doing the tall run you're going to continue to conquer everything that you're aiming for and if you're doing a wide run just like me you're going to keep focusing on finishing off korea finishing off the jurchen tribes up here and then pushing into ming or whichever nations ming blew up from that's when i recommend changing your main trade note to beijing over here since you can pretty much route all of this right here in east asia over to beijing if you're going for a colonization run your main trade node would most likely be Malacca since you can still route everything from up here over down to Malacca. This is what we took for our first two idea groups in a tall slash wide run quality and then economic like i said quality is an excellent opener because we will be utilizing boats quite heavily this entire campaign and then for the second one you can go economic or trade depending on what you want economic is very nice it's going to help us out with the gold mine and other things and trade i already mentioned because we're going to control so many trade nodes over here and then for your third idea group i recommend picking up another mill related idea group maybe quantity or offensive depending on what you want and then for your fourth idea group you could go with another money making idea group if that is your focus such as trade or economic whatever you didn't take previously or you could go for a blobbing focused idea group if you're planning on massive expansion such as admin or diplo for example after that it's totally up to you if you went with the colonization run obviously you went exploration expansion after that you can take everything that we're taking over here in these two other different runs this is what you took for our first four government reforms as some of you may have gone with eastern plutocracy which is an excellent choice if you're colonizing you went with exile colonial companies over here for tier five you do have a unique one the early bushido code right here which increases your samurai force limit and yearly army tradition decay that is a pretty good one i do recommend it along with ashigaru regiments right here an infantry discount and army tradition from battles is very nice 
And of course, these three ones right here are always good picks. For tier 6, I recommend Royal Decree after Absolutism, Aristocratic Court before Absolutism. For tier 7, I recommend Meritocratic Recruitment. For tier 8, you can go with the Gokaido Reform right here for plus 1 merchants. It really does have some really good modifiers specifically for the Japanese region. Very, very good for playing tall. You could also go Exploitation of the New World if you're colonizing. If not, Empower the Burgers or Embrace the Economic Theory. For tier 9, I recommend the 6 Books of the Republic or the Social Contract if you're blobbing out a whole lot. And then for tier 10 and tier 11, and all of them are really good take whichever one you want at that point in the game you won't make a mistake with either one of them and like i said around the time you end up fighting ming your game should look a little something like this if you're not that confident in your abilities or if you're not sure if your game is going to go like mine this save file is available for all youtube members in the save games discord channel and you can continue playing as japan from this state forward let me know in the comments below what's the next nation that i should do a guide on if you enjoyed this video don't hesitate to leave a like it really helps out a lot, and if you like the content and want to see more videos like this, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of them. And you can become a member today, and join the Discord, the link is in the description. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time with another EU4 video.